afternoon or morning, wherever you happen to be. I would like to welcome you to another podcast for uh, the journal. And today we welcome Carrie Granger, um, who we're pleased to have join us. Um, I'd like to say that Carrie and I got to know each other, um, I think in 2012, when I, I think I sent her an email. <laughs> And that led me to um, wow taking a, uh, uh, a an ontological inquiry course, uh, the Being a Leader course at Dartmouth Medical School. And Carrie was one of the leaders of that course. And that led me into uh, joining a professional learning community that um, Carrie was a key part of at that time. And um, what what I would say about um, all of that is that she's been incredibly influential in how I think about ontological inquiry and the importance of continuing to expand our um, our understanding, not just understanding, but our engagement with it. Um, the importance of understand of of pursuing alternative routes to ontological inquiry. And and what I would also say is that Carrie. Uh, is has her own consulting business, and she might want to say a little bit about that. But I'm, my guess is that ontological inquiry is key to the success of that business, and that she's also taught uh, in university settings, um, and you know, utilizing ontological inquiry. And and I just love her. That's it. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm just so grateful that you reached out to have a conversation. It's I can't believe 2012. It's been a very long, very long time. Yes. Uh, who who we've become in the last decade. Yes. Yes. Oh, beautiful. Yes. And, and so, uh, well, ahead. let me just say, yeah, just just for those um, that are, uh, this is your first podcast um, uh, for the journal, Turning Toward Being. Um, my name is Drew Kopp. Uh, uh, from Rowan University, and uh, and I will now, uh, and Kurt, please introduce yourself. Yeah, my name is Kurt Hill. I'm kind of a free agent and have been in the ontological inquiry conversations since 1984 mm -hmm. and have forged a pretty, pretty substantial relation with Drew over the past couple of years where we've batted about these ideas. And Carrie, it's just really a treat to have you here. We look forward to the conversation and see what unfolds. Mm, beautiful. Thank you. And what I love about, there's not a lot of us um, who are engaged in ontological inquiry and go in and out of academia and business. And so every once in a while I meet somebody new, but we have quite a shared history. Um, mm -hmm. So Kurt, that's, that's the case actually for all of us here. So um, that's fun. Mm -hmm. Well, wonderful. Well, where, where do we begin? <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, well, we could, um, one of the areas that, um, uh, what we're looking for, I think is just the dis discovering, you know, what is your, um, uh, where do you locate yourself in the world of, of, uh, ontological inquiry? What is it for you? What are your basic you know, I don't know, what's your practical approach, what's your theoretical approach, really anything you'd like to share about it um, to start start us going, to find out more about um, your world. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, okay. Uh, yes, so my, my, for, my foray into this uh, work, and, and I'll add phenomenology, um, because for me, it's probably more than anything, the as lived experience of what it is to be human. So I, I add, I add the two. Uh, and my, my initial foray was actually from being in the military and uh, being in combat and uh, realizing that everything I had studied about leadership, what I knew about it, I had gone to uh, the US, a US military academy, the Air Force Academy, um, the knowledge didn't really serve me as well as um, the development that I had taken uh, that had an ontological base, meaning 
you know, knowing a leader should be courageous or knowing about leadership and courage was very, very different than accessing being courageous uh, mm -hmm. when faced with my fir first mortar attack. You know, mm -hmm. it was it wasn't, oh, what did the textbook say? It was, how do I be courageous when what is there for me is fear? Mm -hmm. And uh, and I had had a master's degree in leadership at the time, and I was really struck mm -hmm. when in combat and when deployed that I didn't draw so much on that. You know, I I drew on uh, the develop the training and development in being, and I also drew on the sensibilities I had developed through my four years of the Air Force Academy, and um, and so there was there was something really important there. Uh, when I went on to teach at the Air Force Academy, given teach leadership, given the success that I had, I had eventually uh, seen, uh, not at the beginning, but eventually seen. And then I was really confronted with, well, how do you, how do you actually develop the being of a leader that can go into different situations, and what is the cross section of being and knowing? So I began that academic study of. Um, as Caroline uh, brought in, and I think a lot of people who listen to this podcast that eventually led me to uh, creating, co-authoring the Being a Leader course um, uh, that Caroline had mentioned um, before, and I think you can still get access to that. Um, over time, uh, I, I, I saw the impact and the effects of my work on people in many, many different settings. And uh, eventually it was time for me to leave the military. And uh, where I chose to go actually was into the business world. And so I had I had done uh, teaching at the academy. I, I was an assistant professor there. Um, I'd done the conferencing, I'd done the paper writing, things like that. But um, I was really interested in the business world. And the reason I like the business world um, is it's one of the biggest, um, Economic power is one of the most powerful, like, what do you say powerful powers? There's idea power, there's military power, there's economic power, there's um, different kinds of power. And I thought that that I really wanted to participate in a world um, that had an outsized impact on how things turned out for us as a species. Hmm. And I was very bothered by this more for more sake uh, kind of um, context that we lived in without really knowing that we were living in that. And I thought that the business world was primarily responsible for that. Hmm. Um, I, I have since, as a side note, uh, been doing a little bit of looking in um, uh, the, on, the ontological access through uh, moods not just language, but the, the ontological study of moods. And um, Jack Panskeep's work on the seven, seven primal uh, uh, affective states. And, um, you know, you have fear, you have lust. Uh, we all know fight or flight, yeah. Uh, but there's there's lust, there's play, there's, there's seeking. And this, this mood is like a mood of seeking. I found uh, in his work. Hmm. Um, and it's so foundational, you know, he found it in mice, he found it in animals. And, you know, if you look at how uh, affective states are layered, you know, there's there's seven, eight primal ones. And, and after that become the more com complex. Seeking is one of those, uh, which I found really interesting. So this more, this more, the seeking of something of, you know, never quite being satisfied, it turns out it's, it's it's actually very, uh, very central to um, to what it is to be, you know, uh, as central as fear, um, as central as lust, as central as play, as central as care is is this domain of seeking. I thought that was very interesting. Hmm. Side note. Hmm. Um, but but that's, you know, primarily why I went in, into the business world and uh, and um you know, I worked for a consulting firm for a while. I, I learned I learned my chops there. And then uh, when I had my uh, daughter, uh, you know, what it was to be a mother with a voice in the world. Um, 
uh, left me really looking at how do I how do I actually be in the world of motherhood and and have that identity and and still be a, a leader with a voice. And so I uh, created my own consulting firm. Actually, it's coaching. So you know, it's a way to be at home and coach. <laughs> I could be with my kid and I could coach. <laughs> Um, And, you know, little by little that it was mostly a resolution to a a problem I had, which, which is, you know, being the primary caregiver and really being on the world stage was very, very difficult for me. Um, So I chose to go into coaching and, um, and little by little, my, my, my practice grew, my daughter, my daughter grew. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know, almost 10 years later, and, you know, I have, I have a thriving consulting practice. Um, I would say that I have fallen in love with with the problem of mobilization through big changes. And um, you know, you could you could go and you can consult for consulting's sake. You can do transformation for transformation's sake. But for the sake of what am I dedicating my efforts? And at one point, you know, I had some great mentorship from Fernando Flores, and he had said, you know, it would be a tragedy if you just became a great consultant. I went, you know, you're right. It would be, it would be a tragedy. Um, so, you know, what's the what's the problem or the challenge breakdown, however you want to call it, problems more common vernacular. Uh, that that, you know, I I I'm almost obsessed about, I dedicate my service to, my study to um uh you know, what what problem can I fall in love with? And, um, and when I looked throughout, throughout all the sticky wickets and all the complex, unsolvable challenges out there from, uh, one person's life, just a single person's life to an organization, to society, to global challenges at the heart of it, for me, there's a reinvention always. And there's a change, a big change, whether it's a divorce or the loss of a loved one, or, you know, becoming a mother was incredibly challenging for me. Actually, it wasn't easy. Um, It's the best thing ever, but, um, or uh, organizations going through, and that's the field in which I got paid, uh, massive changes, you know, to to see the human suffering happening with mergers, with reorgs, it's, it's quite phenomenal, actually the suffering that people experience at work um, just day to day and the impact that that has on their families and their, you know, future possibilities. And then even if you take it to climate change, uh, climate issues, uh, you know, it, it requires a massive mobilization around a different kind of sensibility and understanding of the future and a different kind of action. Um, what I'm, situated in right now is the rise of exponential technologies. And I'd love to really get into that a bit. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, what it is to midwife this next era of humanity. And so what I get paid for day to day is the mobilization of people around big changes in organizations. And I actually work quite a bit in higher education. Um, I've got higher education, military, healthcare, retail and hospitality, those are my main domains that I that we work in. But higher education is a big deal. And, and right now, a lot of my clients are community colleges. Um, about a community college a week closes. I mean, they are under extreme threat. So is higher education. So, you know, they're gonna really need to reinvent. And my clients are, you know, it's all about the reinvention of relevance and their offers and um, and how they situate themselves in an uncertain and fairly rapidly changing um, you know, environment and, and future. Mm-hmm. And so um, so at the moment, that's that's what I get paid for. And we work <laughs> for Fortune 100 to the Pentagon to community mm-hmm. colleges, right? <laughs> um, but what I'm really interested in and obsessed with is um, is this, is this, is you know, what, what this next era is for humanity mm-hmm. and um, the rise of our, uh, our a new peer intelligence, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, actually, yeah. If, if you don't mind, I think I can, I, I heard a, a, a question <clears throat> and that is um, that, uh, you know, AI, you know, uh, or general artif- or artificial general intelligence, 
um uh there's a lot of stuff to talk about and i want to ask you um but uh, in particular, one might be, um, so I, I'm, I'm in a field called uh, rhetoric in writing studies. Mm -hmm. And in my field, what we are sort of responsible for and administer is what's called the the universal requirement of first year composition in North America, you know, in American institutions of higher education. Um, so for the most part, in most schools, most uh, colleges, students come as freshmen, and during their first year, they take two, you know, uh, writing courses. Um, and uh, and so uh, now, and one of the things that's that that we're dealing with, and everyone's dealing with, is the impact of AI um, as a means of you know, just in the form of and a particular expression of it, uh, Chat GPT, and I think it's uh, currently four. Uh, that's that's publicly available um, as impacting um, students being able to respond effectively to the requirements to pass a given course like this um, with that with without necessarily um, uh, from a wide range of spectrum you know within the field of people engaging fully in the process and embracing it and actually including it to the uh, uh, people who are a bit older and un unwilling or unable to actually engage with it as as a as a disrupting influence, but what what role? That's just a little inkling of the wider sea change that's a, that's a in effect. And so, where where do you play a role in that for people that you're working with, like you know, community okay. colleges, but? But what's the what is the role of ontological inquiry in dealing with that for those those people and institutions that are mm -hmm. facing this uh, crisis? Mm -hmm. That's really interesting. Um, you know, so it's a very tactical question inside a much bigger context. Yeah. Mm, yes. You know, just I I so you know to say I have no answers, but I have some thoughts. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, and I have to, I just have some experience. So I, I, I don't know how to answer that question, but here's what I would say. Here's some thoughts kind of around it. One is the what's relevant is changing. So you kind of have to go to what's the purpose of an educational institution? And if it's a community college and the purpose is to create uh, kind of our economic backbone, that's, I think, a little different than a liberal university. Um, so I think it's, you know, what's you, I think you've got to go back to what does it exist for and what's the relevance of the institution and what's the relevance in the institution to those they offer services to. So sometimes we can get a bit um, excited about what we do and we can forget that it needs to be situated. It, we, we will become irrelevant if it's not situated in terms of what the world needs and what people will pay for. And so um, I think that I would not send my kid to a college that doesn't incorporate how to collaborate and work with AI because she will not be relevant. Um, now, I have found um, in my field, a lot of copycats, right? I look, look, I'm in consulting and, you know, you want to lead a strategic alignment session, ask ChatGBT, it can create an agenda for you, <laughs> you know, but it's not as good as my agenda. Um, but here's a better agenda when I collaborate with it. And I may, it makes, it's more of an augmentation to my work. It's not an automation and those are really two dis important distinctions as we look at the future of work is augmentation and automation and so i find that the more mastery in my firm the more mastery the consultant or the coach has the better they can collaborate and use chat gbt to augment and speed up their work those who do not have much mastery what it spits out is uh, fairly useless, to be honest with you. So you have to know at this point in time how to prompt, how to engage, how to tell. I can read something. I can say that was chat or that was human. I can I can tune in very quickly to that. Um, in fact, I just wrote an article on the future of work, um, the uh, uh, human and the competitive advantage of human connection and humanity, uh, AI and humanity. And 
part of part of what I did is I had AI write my conclusion for me. And it was perfect prose. Perfect prose. But boy, it lacked something. And what it lacked was something human. You know, and what is that, right? And so I think in colleges, it's, you know, it is critical uh, that we begin to see what is the skill set needed to um, to use AI as an augmentation and begin to ask the question, what, what does writing provide outside of the output? Um, right outside of the, excuse me, I'm, <laughs> I did a faux pas. I left my ringer on. <laughs> um, but what does writing provide? Well, to me, it provides a way of thinking, uh, critical thinking, a synthesis of ideas, uh, you know, something like that. And, and I'm going to have to enroll my students, engage my students in what this skill set allows for them to be able to do at the end of their education, right? What possibilities does this skill set open up for them that if they use chat GBT and don't learn that skill set simply for the output of the paper to accomplish the task, what they're not going to be able to demonstrate. So that, that would be my initial reaction to this, to this question. That's great. Uh, it, I, go I, ahead, Kurt. I, <clears throat> I like this. I like this conversation. I like um, kind of this exploration of this new world that's upon us. Mm. And I appreciate your distinction of automation and augmentation. And I and it raises a really large question for me, which is in the in the business world at large. Uh, you know, you talk about that human touch in the last paragraph of that thing you wrote, and I know exactly what you're talking about. Like, there's no spark of humanity there, right? Yeah, there's always a beacon of hope, right? but never a spark of humanity. <laughs> <laughs> beacon and, of hope, you know what right. <laughs> <laughs> And boy, how is that spark of humanity important, right? Especially in this world of ontological inquiry, it's like, this the being of human being. Yes. That's that's like where the juice is. So so it raises the the question for me of in the business world at large, where that spark of humanity, if you will, seems ancillary at best. What what um what interest does do corporate leaders have an augmentation when they can automate that the automation of which improves the bottom line and shareholder, you know, returns greater shareholder value. So, so, so I'm just kind of curious. I mean, I have in the I background, I have, con I have concerns about AI in the, in the business world, but, but so I'm just kind of curious as to your take in there, because that whole piece of humanity being taken out of the puzzle seems like it could be in the best interest of a profit making machine. Mm -hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind yeah. of what I'm curious about. Yeah. It's such a good question. Um, you ever have multiple thoughts competing for your mouth at the same time? Oh yeah. Okay. That's what I'm going through at the moment. Uh, I, I, I do want to challenge, I, you stated the question possibly hyperbolically. I mean, I want to challenge that humanity is ancillary at best in the business world. But I, I understand I, the way you stated it makes the question clear. Yeah. So, um, so here's the thing about, there's a couple pieces to, I think, to be able to bring together a, co a coherent response here. One is um, a fact, the fact about automation and augmentation at this time. Another is humanity as a competitive advantage. And another is demographic changes. Mm -hmm. 
So mm. there's there's kind of three three mm. pieces. Those were the three thoughts that were competing for the same time. Nice. Um, just a fact. Uh, thus far, automation seems to require three times ish humans to have the automation work. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, right. That is interesting. But I see it in, for example, um, well, a client of ours, one of the largest retailers uh, in the U.S. has used automation for self-checkout. You ever notice when you do a self-checkout, there's people kind of watching? Oh, yeah. You have to come and help. <laughs> so the automation of self-checkout has caused not only does somebody have to watch the automation, but then there's a whole IT department to deal with when the automation breaks down, et cetera, et cetera. So if you actually look at the numbers, somewhere between 1.5 to 3X laborers for every automated job. Interesting. This is averaged. I'm sure it's working in some places. We're yeah. out. Yeah. Augmentation, on the other hand, uh, has workers work safer at a faster speed and with more accuracy. Yeah. So augmenting physicians and being able to see what's happening on an x-ray yep. or helping me, uh, I have the idea, you know, I've been starting to practice using chat with my LinkedIn posts. Uh, here's an idea. Or I'll say, I want to talk about this. Give me seven different takes. Okay, I like this one. Then I can take that one and flesh it out a little bit and then take out the beacons of hope and actually say something substantive. Yeah, so that actually speeds my process up a lot. Yeah. Um, so the thing, okay, so that's one is, is augment. And, and it, it does create safety, which is a really big deal. Okay. Uh, people, workers tend to be happier, happier with augmentation, much less hot, happy with automation, which is important to the demographic piece. So in 2018, I think we, um, the people over 65 in the U S surpassed those under five. And by 2030, uh, we are to have worldwide a massive labor shortage. And I mean, yeah, massive. massive. Right. Okay. Uh, if you look at what's happening with Russia, with China, with the big, right. Um, many people will say that the war in Ukraine has a lot to do with increasing with, sorry, with the decreasing labor pool, um, as mm -hmm. much as security and anything else. Mm -hmm. And so, um, uh, so labor shortage is a really big deal. Uh, and, and it's important to make a distinction between um, desk bound workers like myself and desk list workers, laborers. Okay, uh, desk bound, um, it, it, more blue collar laborers. Okay, uh, I don't mean like an emergency room physician. Um, I mean, the, uh, the, um, the ambulatory driver, I mean, the, um, barista, the, uh, I, yeah, the server, the baggage handlers, the TSA pre-check people, um, those kind of desk less workers, construction workers, sanitation, um, if you actually look around the world, 80% of our laborers are desk less. Now, North America is about 60%. Mm -hmm. So now, now combine that with, <laughs> so by 20, 2030, it's projected that for every desk less worker, there will be eight desk less jobs. Huh. For every desk less worker, it is projected worldwide, maybe in the US one in six, but it is projected that by 2030, which is not that far away, every desk less worker of working age 
And there's a lot of demographics to show how this is shifting in China and Russia and US and just Europe and many, many places. For every desk less worker, there ought to be, there's going to be approximately eight. Right now, we're about one deskless worker for every two deskless jobs. Okay, that's about where we are right now, 0.52. Mm -hmm. So by that time, okay, so how are we going to solve that? Now, you're going to say, great, AI came up just in time. We got robots, <laughs> we got quantum computing. Thank God. Except if you look at the, so that's part of actually what is fueling. Yeah. And then if you look at the venture capital funding going into automating jobs, see, I'm not scared of automation taking jobs. I'm, I'm concerned that we're not putting the automation taking jobs in the right category. So 99% of the about $10 billion spent on automating, using AI automating jobs, I don't know if that was English. 99% of the funding in VC in, in the venture capital world, 99% of that 10 billion is going towards automating desk bound jobs. Mm -hmm. There's only about 10 million, 1% going to desk less jobs. Huh. Okay. So then you start to see, huh, this is really interesting. Huh. Yeah. Uh, now, when I go to a restaurant, I don't care if a robot is washing my dishes, but I really care about a robot serving me. In fact, I was recently served by a robot kitty and it was very unfulfilling. It's like re reading an essay built by chat, very humanless. So, and the robot kitty even saying happy birthday. And it was like, oh my God, it's so bad. It has like flashing fluorescent pink lights. You know, it was so bad. And if you touch the robot kitty's, you know, ears, it says, oh, I don't like to be touched. So it's like, it's, it's a very strange thing. Now, meanwhile, I watched a server or a business owner just watch the robot kitty. They weren't very good at cleaning tables. I had to clean my own table. Um, that, that wasn't enjoyable, <laughs> you know? Okay. So what does that say? Is it competitive advantage? What do I want to do as a business owners? I want to find out where human connection really matters and where it doesn't. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then I want to keep those workers. I want to increase the retention of those workers, because that's going to bring, that's going to bring something that other businesses don't have, which is the humanity. Mm -hmm. um, turns out augmentation, like I said, makes people feel safer. They like to work more. Now we're going to have to start doing things that we know to do that have people feel fulfilled and belonging and everything else to make those retention. So that's a very, very long winded answer to say, why would businesses care? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think what they care, what they need to care about is what's the right interaction. Yeah. And where do you put automation, augmentation and humans? Um, and what aspects of a human centered role could be augmented to have mm -hmm. that person perform eight times more effectively than they are today. I think that's fantastic. And if I if I can just, you know, Drew and Cindy, just follow ever so briefly. I'm in healthcare. I have my own business. I have about 100 employees. And we've just started thinking about AI. Mm -hmm. But I get what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And I get the possibility of a AI as something that can free up my staff to yes. be more the being of human oh. beings. <laughs> yes, this is so, this is a possibility is we don't know what it is to be human. And right. I think this is our right. great opportunity to have, you know, it's like, you don't know light without dark. Right. Well, we don't That's know right. human without That's some right. fear. And That's I, right. and, and, and I can, I can tell you, I and mean, I know that this is something that you know, but our client, we work with ophthalmologists all over the country. 
I can tell you that our clients so appreciate the human touch, like the relationship that gets created with another human being. Yes. And I think that this avenue of ontological inquiry and really digging into the being of human being and having that be available for hourly workers, because, you know, I'm paying my staff 18, 19, 20 bucks an hour. And in the ordinary course of events, they're never going to have access to that sort of world. Right. So there's a whole possibility here I can hear in what you're talking about. So that not only are they serving our clients better, but they're also like discovering something about their own humanity in the process of that, because they're not as burdened by all of the things that AI could take off their plate and augment. That's right. So could we, the great, there's a lot of fear and existential, I, I'll call it an ontological vulnerability. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So these are, this is existential technology. Mm -hmm. um, but, but there's a, a real ontological vulnerability about, you know, just our way of life and, and it's exponential. So it's going to happen like that, you know, where we, we are linear thinkers. We, we, are situated as human beings, we're in the present, acting on behalf of a future that's shaped by the past. Yeah. But our past, the way we think about the past, it's a cause and effect kind of linear thing. So we take the past and we project into the future and we act consistent with that projection. Yeah. Yeah. But now we're in exponential times. So we are out of sync. Yeah. We're out of sync with the future we're living into. Right. So it, it becomes a, it becomes, we now have to create new sensibilities. We have to, that, that are, that are a bit different. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. 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 That's really good. <laughs> and challenging, but really and good. very challenging. Yes. Yeah, so I think we're going to learn what it is to be human. But so there's these, there's that. these great opportunities, but the yeah. thing that makes us uniquely human is what we have been historically mitigating. Yes. You know, mm -hmm. mitigate those pesky moods. So sub mitigate those subjective assessments and those interpretations, mitigate, mitigate. No, that's mitigate that intuition, mitigate that temporal orientation of past, present, future, yeah. mitigate the, you know, what we don't even understand. We think we're isolated, right? An isolated eye, not in relation. So it's like, what is it to really be human and could, you know, being situated in moods and temporality in history and, um, our our co-created assessments and you know our relationships and could all that be something that actually flourishes in this new era as we become more human yeah and then what does becoming become in exponential times these are the ontological questions that well I, yeah so this is really great one of the um one of my areas that um I, I find myself constantly returning to is the impact of ontological inquiry as a kind of a corrective to the uh, the sort of modernist quest to become infinite, to be better, to be uh, see, to aggrandize right our what we've got to to build and grow and move beyond where we were. That these are these are tendencies that aren't just tendencies; they're hardwired into the kind of being uh -huh. that we uh -huh. wake up being. Uh -huh. And ontological inquiry, sort of, um, when when conducted with with uh, a, a, a profound degree of integrity, strips that bare and exposes it as empty, as without. Uh, it's just machinery moving in a in, a, in, a, in endlessly in a certain direction, and it's not going anywhere. And that can be, you know, profoundly disturbing to someone who's, you know, to an identity whose life is entirely meaningful only in that machinery that's building towards something that that, that isn't there. <laughs> and so, um, and so when I when I hear ontological vulnerability, kind of what what that what that sounds like to me is is encountering that kind of moment, like like you know, to find out if my business is about, you know, making money and building and, and growing and I encounter what it is to be human, 
uh, and, and a new possibility for being human that doesn't include or sidesteps altogether um, the quest for growth as, as a central component of existence, um, then I'm, I'm confronted with something pretty profound, like, oh my God, like maybe I need to, you know, go live in the woods for a little while or, <laughs> or, or, or write poetry or make music or just sit around and be together with people without necessarily going anywhere about it. So, so I'm just curious, like, um, how, how do you, cause these yeah. are, these are very starkly opposing yes. sort of tendencies, um, how have you, do you, do you encounter that? And have you dealt with that? <laughs> do I, I encounter that in my, in my daily thoughts? Yes. Mm. On my walks. <laughs> yeah. I encounter that while I try to write something coherent. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, I encounter that when I think about is, is the Montessori school, the right school for my child? I think so. Mm. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think a couple things also come to mind. You guys have really great questions. It sparks many different, you know, things coming at once. Um, so death is one thing that came up. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if you've read Radical Hope. Um, if you haven't, it's a must for anybody into ontological inquiry. Radical Hope is very, very important. Who, who's that? Jonathan Lair. Uh -huh. I'll say something about that here in a moment. Mm. I'm going to say something about both of these. Um, one of probably the biggest, and, and both are, prop, are kind of saying the same thing that in a way, Drew, you are. I think one of the most profound shifts I ever had was to understand the meaning of death and the, the importance of death. Mm -hmm. um, that without death, I couldn't imagine anything actually being meaningful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, you know, when I, when I, it was a period of time in which several people in my life were um, dying for different reasons, you know, cancer, suicide, old age, but, you know, just like, you know, sometimes you have those periods where you lose quite a number of people. And, uh, and I just knew I had, a, I had a, I had to have a new interpretation of, of death. And, uh, and when I really got that death gave life and gave meaning, um, I, I began to, to really appreciate it, actually. Mm. Not that I, I love losing a dear one, but it, it is fundamentally what gives meaning, I believe. Um, if you were never going to die, then mm. there's nothing you would not take for granted. Right. And you're just automation. You're just automation, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Um, the other thing, this this book, Radical Hope, it it looks at the the death of the Crow Nation. And um uh -huh. I can't rem I can't remember uh I could actually I, I just wrote about this, but I can't remember the 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 name of the ad the general um here's major general philip sheridan yeah he's uh -huh. he was he was the man tasked with forcing the native americans off the great plains and into reservations and what he knew was that the indigenous people's lives and civilization centered around the buffalo yeah so his strategy exterminate the bison exterminate right. the buffalo first and and their traditional way of life ended in like two decades. Now, when in Radical Hope, they, uh, Jonathan Lear introduces this idea of ontological vulnerability in that in the, when they interviewed Chief Plenty Coups, I want to say, uh, the chief of the Crow Nation. Plenty Coups, yeah. Yeah, he said, he, could, he told his story up to a certain point. And then he couldn't, there was nothing to say after. So what he said is when the Buffalo died, the hearts of my people fell. And after that, nothing happened. It's not that people didn't physically exist. 
it's that their way of life, their world, you know, what Heidegger might call the disclosive space, their world ended, mm -hmm. their way of life, the meaning, it did become an empty and meaningless, but not empty and meaningless, like, and that gave me a new possibility. Right. It was just that there was an ontological death, a death of a way, a death of a being. And so, yeah, I think one of the things why I call this an ontological vulnerability is I don't know if we know what our buffalo is. And I used to think it was the isolated eye that seeks, that achieves, that, um, but I'm beginning to think it may be hum our humanity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so... Um, one of the things I'm fearful of in all of these technologies, it's not just AI, it's, it's how these different technologies are all on an exponential curve and they're compounding together. So you have AI and you combine that with so many sensors out there picking up data, the AI is fueled by other AIs, but then you combine that with the cloud. And what happens is one AI learns from another AI because they're all connected to a super cloud. They're, they've got one brain and they all, here's the data, upload it, oh, we all learn. And then we learn from the learning, yeah? Then you combine that with quantum, like the computing powers, not just computing powers like this, quantum computing. I just saw an article yesterday, quantum computing is now, I thought it was one to two years away. Um, so, as what I'm what I'm concerned about is the lack of governance, the ethics. Like, where are the philosophers? We need the philosophers. We need the, you know, we can't even pass a, you know, basic bill in the United States to, you know, continue our basic level of funding, much less govern. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You know, what like will we still be the dominant species? Are, is, is artificial intelligence an extension or is it a peer? I don't know. Well, <laughs> so let me say something really, really great. Um, uh, there's a quote that you draw from Hariri about um, uh, Neanderthals as being, yes. what is it, too familiar to ignore and too different to tolerate. Exactly. And and what I was left with was that um, AI, whatever this is, what we call AI, to itself is um, likely, and I don't know, but just likely, so fundamentally different that whatever it is that I am occurs as nothing. Yes. I'm like that Neanderthal. Is, like, or like the indigenous peoples of yes. America as the white man colonized. You yeah. Know? Oh, yeah, what a yeah. better metaphor. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. That exactly. we are, you know, we are the, you know, whatever the world that we are and the kind of beings that we are, we're barely, we're like, like half existent, um, half hearted human beings, maybe even only quarter hearted human beings or eighth hearted human beings. And with some sort of, sense of privilege and right that we deserve to have our machinery continue to operate ad infinitum. And, uh, and along comes this wholly alien um, uh, um, uh, kind of existence that, you know, completely sidesteps um, us self-important beings um, uh, as the, the heart and pulse of, of whatever's next uh, in evolutionary, you know, uh, evolutionary development. So, so that's sort of like just to reframe things a little bit, um, that that's the kind of, of ontological vulnerability that we need to face, that we're not, you know, whatever it is that we are. I like love what you said, you know, what is our buffalo? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, what an amazing uh, metaphor to look at um, because we barely even, we so take our buffalo for granted that we we've forgotten for we've forgotten what it is we don't even know it in ourselves <laughs> that's right and we've never had to we're just in the dark without light yeah. um yeah. or the other way around uh you know there's 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 also an epidemic of loneliness and um there are many entrepreneurs who are very happy to provide an ai generated companion and this is our companion is already out there it's already an offer and, you know, I watched a five minute video of Milton Freeman, his voice, his everything. And you know what? It was AI generated completely. Mm. 
So we we better pretty quickly find out what makes us uniquely human. And I, I really appreciate what you said. You know, there's a certain entitlement and laziness and not laziness. That's the wrong assessment, but just a complete ignorance and, and blindness about who we are. And, you know, we're not even really providing who we are to each other. And right. we're anesthetized anesthetized yeah a hundred percent and blind and there's you know i'm thinking about also i'm I'm looking at doing a series on the seven deadly sins um in the age of ai and it's the same seven deadly sins in the age before ai but it's just got higher consequences like a refusal to learn right mm. you know? right huh you know mm -hmm. what it, th these are things what is that, that indolence I'm is that indolence oh what a great word yeah <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, maybe. Mm -hmm, you know, but mm -hmm. what what are the things that already as a leadership consultant were already developing organizations to have a little more advantage over their competitors? It's like no, these actually become existential. Right. Humanity. It's a much it's a much bigger question than a competitive advantage. Right. Well, yeah, it's a competitive uh survival <laughs> it, right. well it's, it, that, it, it becomes right? an, it becomes an existential <laughs> question that we're talking about and navigating that um you know i i listened to a great podcast with um what's his name mustafa Suleiman. yes i yeah, haven't read his book away. i have it mm -hmm. but he speaks in the podcast i listen to he speaks directly to what you're talking about with respect to governments yes and putting guardrails in given that it seems that that barn the horses are out of the barn already mm -hmm. what what do you see what what do you see there about the possibility of governance with i mean those horses have run yeah, and you know, I don't know if the and again, I don't know where this podcast goes, but the um, U.S. administration about a month ago, uh, the Biden administration set out a beginning of a governance um, mm -hmm. on you know even simple things like uh, AI. It's not simple; it's it's extremely important. But AI algorithms, you know, and uh, it, it being very that that the, the they have got to register the algorithms that they're using. What's the data set that you've trained this AI on? Right. Mm -hmm. Because, um, you know, there's if, if AIs are going to make decisions and take actions on those decisions, how are they observing? So now you've got to start to ask, you know, humans aren't great observers. Right. AIs are better observers. But if we've trained an AI based on human observation, like what's the data set we're given, yeah. you know? So yeah. you can see, like, I mean, is there so many ontological, phenomenological intersections here? Right. 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 Um, so that that's one. Um, the other thing that kind of comes to mind, again, I don't have the answers, I have questions, is um, another kind of ontological look is our historicity. And um, culturally, you know, we're a very independent U.S. where much of, you know, Silicon Valley, Palo Alto, this is a lot of where this comes from. Okay. And we, we're very fiercely independent. So you try to have me slow down my business for the sake of humanity. Right. Well, look at all Facebook, even open AI, uh, e you know, people are firing their ethicists. They're slowing them down. Right. If you look at universities, how many universities have shut down liberal arts in favor of uh, more technological programs? And that's an epidemic as well, right? So now I would say, you know, one of my biggest calls to action is like, you know, philosophers get out of your coffee shops and get out into Palo Alto and start bringing some ethical conversations. You know, like it, it, you're relevant now. The time is now. By the way, I would say, I would say uh, to expand the vocabulary beyond philosophers to include rhetoricians. Rhetoric yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. But more so rhetoricians more than ever because you know you look at the the way in which it, I go into organizations and I'm floored. I'm floored. So floored. People don't understand that they 
act and interact in a subjective reality and bump up against an objective one. Now, it unfolds as one, but they don't see the distinction. They don't they don't understand those things, hmm. right? Let's can we talk let's could, we, I'd love to distinguish this a little further. This um uh it's one of my uh areas I'd love to dive into. Um but first I want to check in with uh uh Carolyn <laughs> I, I go for that and then if 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 I have something to add I will. Okay, okay. Um uh so so this is uh this is an area that um by the way, you know, I've I've discovered roots of this that go back, you know, you can find this going way back. Uh so it's not like someone just recently invented this distinction. I um, mean every, everything we talk about. Let's just say that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> everything um but um but there there are useful terms right and and so this this uh one sort of set of oppositions here we call um we can say the epistemological world view um and versus the ontological world view and that um uh what makes something epistemological so to speak is that it, it has something that uh it has qualities that are observable or it, it exists within a, a frame that allows anyone to discover oh there's a chair there and then 10 minutes later someone can walk along and oh there's a chair there and then later we can talk about the chair that we both saw in the hallway you know but what we what i can't ever talk to you about is um, uh, well, I can talk about it, but I can't ever discover what you saw when you saw the chair, you know, your subjective experience of something, right? And, and, and it, and it's from that point of view, of course, you know, the epistemological point of view, anything subjective can be, you know, questioned or dismissed. Um, but there's, there's this hidden dimension to it, seemingly hidden, which is what we're calling the ontological dimension that's only accessible through this, through my subjective experience of whatever it is that I'm experiencing that others might experience objectively. Like if they see me weeping or in pain, you know, they might say, oh, he's weeping or he's in pain, but they can't experience my sadness or the suffering that I'm going through. Only I can in any given moment. So, so I love to just want to bring that present as a, as a little bit, you know, that this, this is the key component that um, how do we turn toward that um, and enter into that, my own sort of experience of that and, um, and what might be, I don't know, strategies or, or like, how do you walk into a business environment and begin to evoke uh, <laughs> amongst those there uh, attending to this um un this sort of unplumbed unlooked at dimension of existence in such a way that that you know they undergo the challenge that it might oh you know in overthrowing and and disturbing the way things go the status quo of of, of life because that's going to happen whenever we do have a profound en encounter with our own being yeah. Okay, good. And and I'll just create a little bridge from the former conversation into it, which is yeah. uh, large language models um, can mimic and shape and participate in the subject of reality, but thus far can't experience it. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's great. So uh, I'd actually like to include phenomenology. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the way that, and I don't know if this is right from an academic rhetoric or philosophical perspective, but I'll just say the way that I relate to epistemology, ontology, and phenomenology, and they all go like this together. Um, so please feel free to correct this for, you know. So from, from my perspective, epistemology is what and how we know. And it usually has an about. Um, uh, ontology is the nature of it. Like how we know it, what we know about it, and how we know it. That's one. The nature of it from inside it. And, and then phenomenology is how we experience it. My as-lived mm. experience. So the nature of something can exist. Mm apart from my experience of it. Mm -hmm. 
will I ever or even actually, or or your knowledge of it or my knowledge of it exactly mm-hmm. exactly so I would say my work is looking ontologically but very much the access is is always a phenomenological access and so if I know so part of the nature of human of what it is to be human is to be thrown or is to be ready at hand um, in any given situation. So like my, I have a flip chart in my office. Well, the flip chart occurs for me um, to be like, to be written on um, in some settings and, and not, and definitely not to be written on in other settings. But for my 10 year old, the flip chart is to be created. Oh, oh, right. So she walks in and the flip chart's a toy, right? It's it's to be engaged with. It's it really is is really a very different occurrence for her. Um, and so what I find as I work with groups of people is that when I provide distinctions that help them see, uh, help them see what they already know, understand what they already know. Many people do do exist in epistemological realm because they haven't been developed otherwise. So how they encounter things and phenomena is through explaining, explanations and concepts. So when I begin to walk with them in how these phenomena occur, show up, present themselves to us, they go, yeah, that's right. So it's it's less, I never try to explain, I never try to give a distinction without first walking into the disclosive space with them and looking like, kind of revealing the world in which they already are. So I'm giving language to their phenomenological experience. And when they have language for something they already know, it just, it it allows them to navigate that space immediately better. So I'm never bringing in these distinctions when I'm working with people because my relevance is to allow them to navigate their relationships and their situations more effectively. So I simply reveal and give language to their on the core or as lived experience. And they go, that's right. Mm -hmm. What else you got? (laughs) Right. (laughs) So, you know, I might say, look, you know, I, 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 you know, you're never interacting with the room at 68 degrees. You're only interacting with the room is too hot or it's too right. cold. Right, right. Right. And, yeah. and then after they get that experience, I'll bring language to there's an object of reality and a subject of reality. And for you, they all, you know, she looked at me like she doesn't belong. She looked at me like I don't belong shows up for you as that's what's happened. No, she looked at me and like I don't belong are two different acts of speech that gives me, orients me t- towards or away from different actions. So I, I go into their world, I make the distinction, and then they're able to act and navigate a bit more effectively. Hmm. Nice. Very cool. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're about wrapping up right now, right? We are. <laughs> what do it we is. do now? Uh, <laughs> yeah. That's our experience. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. This is really fantastic. Mm-hmm. It has been a fantastic conversation. And um, what's been running through my mind through much of it is just the the, 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 the prevalence of in order to and how AI just you know, is such a is such a fit for human beings who are run by in order to mm-hmm. right? and, and this idea that you're proposing of augmentation is so is so powerful because mm-hmm. you have to have the wherewithal to think that you are the chooser, right? <laughs> to be able to imagine how to augment something, mm-hmm. right? Instead mm-hmm. of 
you know, just simply the user of something. Um, it's it's uh, it's a very different sense of agency. Um, yeah, there's just so many things we could talk about. It's been absolutely fabulous. I, maybe we we could uh, uh, this might help us conclude here for a second. But there's a there's this wonderful um, I don't know if you've ever uh, you've heard of a figure in um, literary history named Doctor Faustus mm. or Faust. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but Goethe um, uh, is sort of a nineteenth century um, uh, German romantic poet writer, but he was also like a man of of all worlds, so to speak. And um, he was a politician and you know, all this other stuff. But he wrote Faust. Um, and one of the central principles of this was he sort of revised the myth a little bit. And um, and so Faust was a was someone who had conquered all possible intellectual pursuits of his yeah. of his era and yeah. reached the very limits and and now was beginning to search for something beyond the world of epistemology. And he began to encounter what we would call an ontological world. And when he did that, as he began to do that, what came forth was the figure Mephistopheles, mm. who is AI, basically mm. the, the the machinery able to provide at a whim. At a, if you can clearly ask what you want, then it will be given to you, right? And and but the deal is, is that as soon as as Faust no longer had what you call seeking, that's when his soul goes to hell. Yes. And so the saving principle of of this uh, particular narrative is is that that this particular kind of human quality is what ultimately transcended the the and you know the 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 answers that always are provided by Mephistopheles to resolve any question. Um, that there's something more, uh, something unquenchable, unnameable, unfathomable, or mappable that is what we are, and mm -hmm. uh, and so as a as a way to kind of look at that's kind of what we're after, I think, um, and in looking at this this uh, interesting crazy world of ontological inquiry, <laughs> um, and how to make it present for us, you know. Uh, and so, Carrie, thanks for uh, being here with uh, to, to to build a little fire uh, mm -hmm. and have a conversation around it. Uh, you know, maybe okay. noticing stars or whatever in the night sky. Yeah. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. And I, I love that in a way you kind of end with a, you know, where we began. And I do think purpose is an identity is really central to this this question um, as we reinvent you know, what it is to be and become and in, in this uh, new era. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. Really great. Thank you so much. Just to- Oh, you're welcome. Light. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. On All to right. the next one. See you, Carrie.